This is One on One. We're pleased to welcome Andrew Parton, Executive Director of the Cradle of Aviation Museum based in Long Island, where? Garden City or East Garden City, Uniondale area. What's the Long Island connection to all this? Uh, basically, if you go back, we're not the birthplace of aviation. It's where aviation kind of grew up. And a lot of it was the uh, topography of Long Island is flat and windy, uh, if you go back 100 years. And the biggest thing was we were close to the prize money, which was Manhattan. Uh, most of the early aviators were big daredevils, and um, they basically mm. migrated to Long Island for the prize money. Uh, and so that's where we became kind of that cradle. You know, when I was getting ready for the show, I, I kept seeing the Charles Lindbergh connection to all this. Make it clear. Well, Lindbergh took off from uh, what was Roosevelt Field, uh, which sat next to Mitchell Field, which is where the, the museum is based. You had that, uh, the commercial airport and the military airport side by side. So Lindbergh, again. Um, right, what are we looking at right there? We are looking at the first airplane that Charles Lindbergh ever owned. Uh, this is before what? the Spirit of St. Louis. Before? Before the Spirit of St. Louis. You guys have it. We have it. It was a World War I surplus. He bought it for a couple hundred dollars. And he was a barnstormer in the Midwest, which meant... Tell people, people what that means. Well, he flew around a small town, would kind of buzz the town, land in the middle of a field, and then he'd charge you a couple of dollars to go take a pl uh, flight. That's what Lindbergh did? That's what Lindbergh before did. Before Lindbergh became Lindbergh? Before he became Lindbergh. And he migrated to Long Island because, again, that's where the prize money was. It was to be the first to do things, wow. first to fly across the country, first to fly the Atlantic. Uh, and Lindbergh was able to be the first to actually do it. A number of others tried, but you never hear about them. You know, everyone knows about uh, Lindbergh, but they don't know about, uh, is it Harriet Quinby? Harriet Quinby. Who is uh, that? She was the first female licensed pilot in the United States. Um, she was an actress by trade. Uh, but also was uh, a bit of an attention seeker. So she came to Long Island, learned to fly an airplane, got her license, uh, and was the first woman to fly the English Channel. Mm. And her big um, hope was that this was going to rocket her into stardom uh, beyond the stage. Uh, unfortunately, the day she crossed uh, the English Channel was the day the Titanic sank. That was the same day? Yeah. So instead of being on the front page, of every paper in the, country, uh, in the world, she was basically buried. But it was a big deal. Oh, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And the museum helps people understand that. Yeah, we go through uh, a lot of what we do. It's preservation of the history. Um, right. It's education, so using the museum to educate kids about the science and technology and the people behind the aircraft. Mm. And then we use it to inspire. We hope to get kids interested in aviation and aerospace as a career path. Do, do the aerospace piece. Uh, what, what, what do people see there? Aerospace for us, uh, uh, most of it centers around the Apollo program. Uh, Explain to people why that's so significant. Well, if you look at that, Limber, uh, the Wright brothers took off in 1903. Only 66 years later, we landed on the moon. Um, and a lot of that technology and the engineering that was done was done by Grumman Aerospace on Long Island. All the lunar modules. Grumman on Long Island. Grumman on Long Island. All the lunar modules were built on Long Island. Uh, and we have one of the three that didn't go to the moon. The program was cut uh, after Apollo 17, and there was plans for 18, 19, 20. So there's one at the Smithsonian, one at the Kennedy Space Center, and we are uh, lucky enough to have one of those. How did you get into this? Uh, I was in uh, banking before, uh, <laughs> and I had a uh, former client ask me to uh, uh, join the museum in a capacity, and I did and became director about 11 years ago. So, Passion for you. It is now, yeah. I've always been uh, big on history. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the neat thing is that um, a lot of people have no idea of the history that Long Island and the role Long Island mm -hmm. played in history in aviation. Talk about history. Um, World War II period in aviation. Long Island produced more aircraft than any other place in the world. In the world? In the world for the war effort. Because you had Grumman and Republic, as well as a number of smaller manufacturers building aircraft constantly on Long Island. What's uh, the, um, Georgia, we have a picture. What, the World War II Hellcat? The Hellcat, that that's a, a picture of our World War II gallery. Grumman built the Hellcat, the Wildcat, um, and, so, and the Avenger. And this is a picture of the Avenger that sits in our World War II gallery. Uh, and uh, so they were churning out aircraft constantly. You know, the Rosie the Riveter is working at night 
uh, and working during the day while the men were off to war. Mm. Um, and at the height, Grumman employed roughly 30,000 people on Long Island in, uh, in manufacturing. There's a big science, technology, engineering, and math STEM component to this. Talk about it. Uh, well, we use the museum's collection, uh, the aircraft and artifacts, to really teach STEM. To How do you do that? Uh, we do a lot of hands-on learning for the kids, so they're in classroom settings, and then they'll go into the museum to use the aircraft and the artifacts to illustrate that theory. You know, whether it's uh, the speed of aircraft, and there's a program that the FAA does that we use called Fly by Math. So it's how do you get aircraft to go different distances with different weights um, and different fuel uh, to get in on time. So uh, kids could actually, young people, students, could actually get into this because they're fascinated by the museum. Well, that's what we're hoping. We, we call it the three missions is preservation, education, and inspiration. And if a school group comes in or one of our high school programs works where the light bulb goes off in a kid's head and he gets excited about aviation or aerospace and the future of aerospace, mm. uh, then we can help connect them with local companies. Before I let you out of here, uh, we have a shot of the planetarium, if we could. Let's go to it. Tell us about the planetarium. Planetarium is in our uh, dome theater. Uh, it's a 300-seat theater, and we use that to try to get you really wow. excited about... Uh, uh, aerospace and future travel. That is awesome. Listen, uh, we appreciate you sharing the story with us, and I know we have a big audience on Long Island as well who will appreciate it, but everyone in the region is invited to go visit the Cradle of Aviation Museum out in Long Island, uh, East Garden City. Right, Charles Lindbergh Boulevard. Is that really the name? <laughs> yeah, that's the name of the that street. That is so around. awesome. Uh, Andrew Partner, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Well done. Be right back right after this. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Investors Bank, Hackensack Meridian Health, Verizon, Choose New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.